and the lessons and still behave in the same risk manners and continuing to pump money into lobbying to the Congress and to the governments for not to have more regulations even with Dodd and Frank. So how many how many people we seen the the industry have like your mind to really want to enforce this type of um, new regu uh, regulations and changes? The, um, since I was both in the investment banking world, which is governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission, I've also been a bank officer operating in my case under the jurisdiction of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And I can tell you that the regulatory regimes in those two different industries is extraordinarily different. In my career in the securities industry, at every step of receiving more and more authority and more management responsibility, I had to take examinations and be licensed to demonstrate that I had sufficient knowledge of the law and of regulation in order to do my job. And I think by the time my career concluded, I held about seven different securities licenses. They're not easy. They're complicated exams. They run anywhere from three to six hours in length. And you really need to understand securities law. And if you don't pass, you're, you can't hold the position of authority. In the banking system, there are no such exams. There are internal training programs that every bank takes its, its junior people, they bring them into their first employment, and they effectively retool them. They teach them what they want them to know, but there's no one who's effectively acting as a licensing agent. And it might very well be that we need to change the nature of bank regulation and be more intrusive. The banks have have been treated in a very, very laissez-faire fashion when they are such important financial intermediaries. Um, you could have a situation where if the stock market went away tomorrow, it wouldn't have an enormous amount of impact. It could be smaller than it is today. But it's a pretty well-regulated business and pretty highly controlled, too. Easy to audit, easy to observe. But there are whole elements of the markets in which banks engage, which are completely opaque. If you wanted to ask for a price, you couldn't easily get it. You couldn't look it up on the internet. If you want to know what the last sale in Home Depot was, it's only a mouse click away on a computer. If you want to ask where the, the five-year note um, coming due in May is, you've probably got to contact four dealers before you have any idea what the price is. So it may need, it may, we may need to, to make banks more accountable by, in, as they are in the model of more highly regulated businesses. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, you touched upon things like regulatory capture and things that the Fed has done for you know, these institutions during this crisis. Can you talk about the ownership of the Fed? seeing that the Fed is mostly owned by banks uh, to begin with. The Federal Reserve Board is a private bank um, operating at the pleasure of the United States Congress in coordination with the U.S. Treasury. It was instituted in the early part of the 20th century because prior to that we had a repeated series of very severe financial crises. At the end of the 19th century, several severe depressions, and then a really calamitous crash in 1906, there was no Federal Reserve Board. And indeed, um, the United States government itself was tottering at, in 1906, and it was J.P. Morgan himself who effectively went to all of the major banks in New York in order to make sure that there was a consortium of the banks that would absolutely be committed to buy the treasury obligations of the United States government. And at that point, it was, it was thought it might be wise if we actually had a central bank that could step in and conduct a monetary policy so that we don't have these wild swings back and forth. The first central bank of the United States was in the early 
19th century, and it was highly disliked. It was seen as being intrusive on the power of the states, and was ultimately, this, was, this bank was established, the Bank of the United States, was established by Alexander Hamilton, was really despised by Hamilton's opponents, and ultimately, under the reign of President Jackson, it was eliminated. So we went without a central bank for about 90 years until 06 was such a disaster that it was determined that we needed to have a, someone who could conduct monetary policy. Yes? Uh, the way OTC swaps were described sounds like uh, each participant bets against the other, but each winning bet is, pay, is uh, paid by the losing party that no longer has winnings to pay the bet with. So, Might not have the winnings. Uh, what my question was, was what is the private incentive to participate and why should this be allowed for anyone to do with anyone else's money? That's a good point. The, the, reason swaps, the reason the swaps market came into business was that there was customer demand, if you will, for much longer dated hedging activity. Prior to the existence of these where you had you had markets, um, just to use a simple example, you had, you had wheat futures, you had lumber futures, and then starting in, in the early 70s, you began to have financial futures, futures on currency, futures on treasury bonds, and on um, Ginnie Mays and Fannie Mays, government-sponsored entity debt. These were burgeoning, they were very clever innovations, but the markets were quite small. They were operated in Chicago, but the overall size of the market was nothing like the scale of what participants in the banking industry needed. So you could effectively make trades that would last until the next day, or that might last for a week, or not much longer than that, unless you were using futures. So swaps, if you will, became an over-the-counter substitute for futures markets because the banks had far more capital than a group of individual floor traders at the Board of Trade or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We were far too small to take on counterparties of this size. And I think um, the people have been conscious of the credit risks that are involved when people say that, um, you know, don't, don't worry about these enormous notional amounts of swaps because they net out, their market risk might net out, the credit risk clearly doesn't. The, um, I would say that at least for the past 20 years, every time you get conventions of swap dealers, they're all talking about the growing amounts of credit risk among themselves. They know it, they're not blind. It's just that, that that's not an issue you want to talk to the public about. You want to do everything you can to minimize the apparent size of these transactions. But people engage in it because they make profits with it. And if you're a good swap dealer and you know how to run your book and manage your risk, it can be a phenomenally profitable business. And if you happen to be a customer who's not so sophisticated, caveat emptor. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, <clears throat> form here that we got at the door uh -huh. uh, with the header Occupy Wall Street, which is obviously you know pretty hard to ignore at this point. Right. Uh, it's going into I think it's seventh week now. Um, do you see any recent changes in policy um, from the banks themselves as a result of these protests, or, or, or do you think that changes in policy are going to be made? What, what's the insider impact of that? Good question. Mm -hmm. um, I learned in my days at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange that you need to address your industry problems before they get into the hands of Congress. That's the last group of people you want to create solutions for your business. Because they generally don't understand your business as well as you do, and they will overreact you may wind up with some very draconian policy responses as a result of it. The response of the Wall Street firms, I think, has been mixed. Several CEOs have done, 
they've had the proper public rea relations reaction, which is to say that the people in the Occupy movement have a point. They have a reason to be aggrieved. That's at least an appropriate way to respond to them and say, we're open to dialogue, we're trying to be good corporate citizens, put the bright face on what it is that we do every day. And there have been just some awful tone deaf responses, um, particularly I must say by Brian Moynihan at Bank of America. He came out, I think it was last Friday, in a, an internal speech to rally the troops and get them motivated and said that he was incensed at the way that state and municipalities were reacting to Bank of America and the new debit card fee that they were going to impose. In fact, some communities in California have started pulling money out. They're taking their deposits out of the Bank of America. And I, I just thought, you're incensed about people protesting your imposition of fees to use their own money? How oblivious are you to being able to understand what the concerns of people are? They've lost value in their homes. They have, in many cases, enormous obligations under those loans. They're losing value. They can't get mortgages. They can't refinance and move to a place where they might be able to get a job. And another inept comment where he said that Bank of America had a right to make a profit. For any of us who've been in this business, we have, we, it's right to say that we have a right to compete to make a profit. But no one ever guar guaranteed me a profit when I was a risk taker at any of the banks where I worked or on the floor of an exchange. That's not capitalism. You have to take risk to be able to make a profit, and you're not always going to be a winner. To say that you have a right to make a profit suggests that this is an imprimatur for you to print money. If you want to make money, you have to take risk and you have to take the consequences. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then one last question. Uh, what exactly do you feel is the role of academia, like universities like the New School and NYU, Columbia, in making sense of all of this information, especially at a time right now, um, what do you think is... I think that role? an important role that can be played in the academic community is that someone has got to be able to stand in for the lack of critical thinking and critical observation that we, that we find in our press. The typical sort of response that you see in the media today is that they buy into the concept that these things are too difficult to understand. They are not, period. You can obfuscate, you can make this appear to be far more complex than it is, but there's no need to do it. If universities can create a forum where people can simply say, let's not listen to the assertion of paid um, press spokesmen or to so-called experts who are going to try and tell you that no, there's nothing to see here, just Running move on. Capitalists believe. That's right. You know, we're, we're, we're proponents of tooth and claw capitalism until it bites us. What I tried to talk to you about tonight is driven very much by data and by facts that are publicly available information. It didn't take me a great deal of time to sort these things out. They're on the public record. But if journalists aren't going to go out and do the hard work, then that needs to be filled in by people in the academic community who basically are going to be a lot more friendly to people who want to be numerate. Um, yeah, so after all of this, oh yeah, claps. Um, yeah, it's pretty evident that America's like a closeted oligarchy. Um, but the question is, if you have uh, such corruption where those with the resources, those with the money, only serve uh, the one percent, to use the buzzword, how do these people get elected, you know? Like, a, a lot of the elected officials that are getting uh, the vacations and the boat rides, they campaigned and won over all the votes. Like, politics is a huge issue, but 
regardless of whether if you're Democrat or Republican, you know, both parties were complicit. Um, our system's clearly broken, but how do we always manage to elect people who are just going to continue the corruption? Because it takes money to mount a campaign. Right. We don't have the ability to have public finance in any meaningful way of the electoral process. And when you think about the lifetime of a newly elected uh, congressperson, here's what happens. They come into office, they take the oath, and they're walking in with a large debt from the campaign that got them there. They have to spend the first year finding donors to retire that campaign debt. And then the next year, their two-year term, they've got to find donors who are going to finance their next campaign. What I would argue is that if you want to get the Congress out of the thrall of money, you have to do one of two things, preferably both. One is that you need to get the parties to agree to much shorter campaigning periods to reduce the amount of money that's required to win elective office and to provide for public financing of congressional and presidential camp Senate and, and presidential campaigns. Secondly, you need to get corporate money out of the process. The Citizens United ruling at the Supreme Court has effectively offered up our congressional representatives to be bought and sold, and often without a paper trail. I recently made a contribution to one of the congressional campaign committees of $200, and I was required to sign disclosure forms that I had not previously given more to state that I was a citizen and that I was a registered voter. So I made more disclaimers than probably any corporation who contributes to political action committees or campaigns was required to disclose. I would encourage you all to take a look at a website called getmoneyout.com. It is a, a petition drive to get a, a, a congressional, uh, excuse me, a constitutional amendment to effectively overturn the Citizens United case and to make it against the law for non-persons, i.e. corporations, to make political campaign contributions. So take a look, and if you agree with the terms of the petition, please sign it and tell your friends. Any other questions? Always. Um, my two questions have already been partly answered. One, which came also from my colleague Simon, um, is what we as academics can do. Um, and I hear you saying, raise the issues, encourage students to be really critical, and look at the data and look at root causes. But can you uh, say anything else about what we as instructors can do as well as what students can do? My experience with the Occupy movement in Chicago has been interesting because there are two daily events. I'm not all that familiar with what's happening in Zuccotti Park and their daily agenda. In Chicago, General Assembly is at 7 o'clock in the afternoon or in the evening, but every day they have a teach-in at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so far, it has mostly been um, academics that have run the teach-ins. It hasn't been ordinary folks standing up without a particular expertise. But I think that lens... Uh, How can we get more folks like you, not necessarily academics, but people who have real experience and hard evidence about how this operates to do more teach-ins? I think that there's an enormous opportunity through social media. Um, you know, the, the whole Arab Spring is very much based on that and being able to use the power of individuals because we aren't going to be able to organize our own political action committee. That's not going to happen. We are not going to be able to afford to go down and compete with $4 billion a year in political campaigning of the Congress. That's not our role and it's not our power. I think what we need to do is to not only keep the demonstrations alive, but to give them an air of authority. Joseph Stiglitz spoke in New York, did he not? I, I mean, 
that's the role that I think that the academic community can play. First of all, um, your talk was absolutely profound and I have so much respect for you. And a topic that really touched me was what you spoke about um, in terms of college loans and things like that. As students who have college loans, should we be worried? I mean, these people sound like such, I don't know, you know, so uh, selfish and, you know, like, I'm scared now. <laughs> and, you know, I'd like to be able to completely allay your concerns. I just read a statistic last month that said that a 2008 graduate with student debt coming after their degree would still be paying off that debt in 2028. Half of them would be. What was the source of this information? In Harper's in Magazine has an yes. index, and they cite their references um, on the back page. OK, so this is one question I'm raising for you. Always ask the source, and then be critical about whether there was an agenda behind the source. Excuse me, I just the, have to say that. One, w w to address your point about concern, the Bankruptcy Act, of course, has now said, in essence, now that we've captured you as a customer, you're not going to get away. And they will make it quite difficult to default on student loans. This is one of the reasons why they push so hard to get the bankruptcy laws modified, to make it more difficult for those in debt to seek relief. And in my mind, what I've said to a number of people down on LaSalle Street is to say, if you're unhappy, for example, about this recent imposition of debit card fees, then let your feet do the walking. If you have an account at Bank of America, take the money out and go and take it to a community bank. Take it to a credit union. Or go to the ATM, take cash out, and don't use your debit card. Debit cards hurt you, and they hurt merchants. You go in and swipe your debit card to buy a cup of coffee. You just paid that debit card holder 21 cents plus five one hundredths of the value of the transaction, and the merchant's got to pay 38 cents himself. That makes prices higher for all of us. So if you, are, if you want to register your protest, the way you get it across is to hit them in the pocketbook. Do less business. If you can take your business to a community bank, which is really going to have benefits that redound to you and your neighbors, do that. The big banks don't need your subsidy. Any additional questions? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to us. I do appreciate it.